Thank you very much for that extraordinarily kind introduction. Dr. Warren Sprith, President of the CDB, Governors and Directors of this auspicious bank, members of the Diplomatic Corps, other distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, and also to you, Alison Damas. Thank you very much for this invitation. It is a great honor to be here this evening. I'd like to thank the Caribbean Development Bank for the invitation, and also to thank the government of Jamaica for, as always, the ex extremely warm hospitality. I'm also delighted to be here in my role as special representative of the Secretary General. It's a real honor to work for Ban Ki-moon, a man of great vision, integrity, and courage, who put energy access and sustainable energy for all at the heart of the development agenda, beginning nine years ago when he took office. Before I deliver the lecture, I'd like to read out a message from him to you. It begins, I'm pleased to send greetings to the 17th William G. Damas Memorial Lecture. Last year was an exceptional year for international cooperation. World leaders adopted the Addis Ababa Action Agenda, the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development, and the Paris Agreement on Climate Change. Taken together, these game-changing commitments promise to transform the global economy, expand dignity and opportunity for all and leave a healthier planet for future generations. The 17 Sustainable Development Goals of the 2030 Agenda are comprehensive and integrated. A worldwide transformative approach to energy will bring new prosperity and well-being to billions of people and provide massive new investment opportunity. The objective is encapsulated in SDG 7 with three interlinked targets on universal access, energy efficiency and renewable energy. Here in this region, many nations are rising to the challenge to provide sustainable energy. These commendable efforts carry important lessons for the rest of the world. Around the globe, new and exciting partnerships are forming, including recent strong collaboration between multilateral development banks and the United Nations. Here on the front lines of climate change, you know that we are at a pivotal moment. The world's appetite for energy continues to grow and the global thermostat continues to rise. While the direction of travel is set, much more needs to be done to reach our destination. This includes putting a price on pollution, providing incentives for low carbon growth throughout the world, and especially in developing and vulnerable countries, including of course, small island developing states which need timely and meaningful assistance. By working together in partnership, we can achieve Sustainable Development Goal 7 and all the goals. I urge all actors over the coming decades to ensure that we build a sustainable future that leaves no one behind. So it is in this spirit that I'm honored to be here today. So this is me, not my boss. The UN Charter begins with we the peoples of the United Nations determined. We the peoples, not just a few, not just the fortunate, not just those on high land, the ones with reliable and affordable access to food and shelter, clean drinking water, education and health services and sustainable energy. We the peoples is everyone. That's why we're called Sustainable Energy for All. Because there are over 1.1 billion people today who still have little or no access to energy, three billion people rely on wood, coal, charcoal, or animal waste for cooking and heating. Yes, and access is a question for this region too. It's not just Haiti's lack of access to energy for many, it is the lack of access to reliable, affordable energy, which is our mission too. Energy is the dominant contributor to climate change. It accounts for one big chunk of the problem, but also the way transport uses energy and industry uses energy is another big chunk of the problem. Energy is central to nearly every major challenge and opportunity the world faces today, be it jobs, 
security, climate change, food production or increasing incomes, access to energy for all is essential. We the peoples want a planet and a future that's not ravaged by climate change. We the peoples deserve access to affordable, clean and reliable energy. And we the peoples decided last year and their leaders decided last year that the time for action is now. The impacts are being felt all over the world, nowhere more so than here in the Caribbean. Rainfall patterns are changing, which has caused a series of islands to experience prolonged dry seasons and severely low reservoir levels. The generation of electricity from fossil fuels is water intensive. Drought can then impact the reliability and cost of electricity supply. On the other hand, a large amount of energy is required in pumping and treating water. Without a reliable supply of water, the reliability of electricity access is put at risk. And without energy, water cannot be treated and distributed. With climate change, the water energy nexus and the foundation that it plays in society is increasingly threatened. Forest fires throughout the Caribbean are getting more intense, threatening homes, livelihoods, wildlife. Grenada faces the strong possibility of land loss from a rising sea, while Jamaica's coastal infrastructure, airports, government buildings will become increasingly threatened. In October last year, the Bahamas were just the last of a long line of islands who have endured uh, an intensity and an um, impact from storms that has not been the norm. 85% of the homes on Crooked Island were destroyed. Over 36 hours, you saw the satellite maps with that storm resting menacingly over the islands, closing airports, destroying communications, including electric infrastructure. So what needs to happen? Securing affordable, clean, and reliable, sustainable energy is, as the introduction said, at the crux of the effort to combat poverty and the effort to combat climate change. In order to stay well below two degrees, and remember in Paris we actually went further than that, we said that we wanted to be well below two degrees. In fact, for small island developing states, we need to be at 1.5 to stay alive. So in order to get to 1.5 and meet the development goals, we will need to at least double the amount of renewable energy in the mix by 2030. We will need to at least double the rate of efficiency by 2030, and we need to secure that access. Access for the 1.1 billion who don't have it now, because we said we would not leave anyone behind. So that means that we need to peak emissions. At the moment, the aggregate of all of the plans that countries have submitted suggests that we will peak around about 2025. Not enough if you want to be at 1.5 to stay alive. We need to peak by 2020. We will need to enact smart policies that will spur innovation and get that finance flowing. We will need to get prices right. And we will need to invest $12 trillion in renewables in the next 25 years. That's 5.2 trillion above business as usual projections. Now, even with all of the momentum that was created in 2015, there are still many who would put barriers in front of us or not act with the urgency and determination that is necessary. Where I come from, a smallish island too, a bit colder, tied to this region with so many strings and so many people, some full of joy, some of those strings, stories of sadness. Where I come from, we're not bad at cricket on a good day. We're good at rugby and football too. But in Wales, where part of my family comes from, we say that leaders must be poets before they are leaders because they must speak words that have first traveled through the heart. This is a region of poets, and we will need all of our hearts, as well as our minds, if we are to face the challenges of sustainable development in an age of climate change. It was the St. Lucian poet, Derek Walcott, who wrote in his retelling of the Odyssey, 
The future happens no matter how much we scream. The future is happening, there's no doubt. In fact, it's here, but here in a really positive way. Last year saw a new record in investments in renewables, $329 billion. For the first time last year, the investment in renewables was larger than non-renewable sources of generation. In 2015 was the first time that that had happened. $167 billion in clean energy in developed countries, $162 billion uh, in developing. The price of solar is plummeting. Solar and wind in Morocco is now at cost less than three cents a kilowatt hour. You have your own stories of remarkable price and success here in the Caribbean. Most traditional lighting is being displaced by white LEDs in some parts of the world, which each decade get 30 times more efficient, 20 times brighter, and 10 times cheaper. 58 Fortune 500 companies have joined something called Renewable Energy 100 and committed to procuring 100% of electricity from renewable resources. A recent report from the Climate Group showed that those companies are already more than 50% of the way towards their renewables goal. And you know what happened when they did that? Not only did they, of course, change the dynamic of their own company, their own investability, they sent a very strong signal to the financial markets that we now have a long-term corporate offtake, which allows them to bring their mainstream clients into the renewables business for the first time. Sustainable Energy for All is also supporting the climate group in their newly launched EP100, showcasing the world's most influential businesses committed to, on the flip side of committing to 100% purchase of renewable energy, to doubling their energy productivity. It's not just big connected to grid style renewable projects that we are talking about, where the excitement is, where the future is today. In Bangladesh, utilizing pay-as-you-go mobile phone style financing, 3.8 million solar home systems have been installed in the past few years, generating a total of 135 megawatts of electricity with more than 15 million people benefiting. And that is a partnership of the Bangladesh government, of local organizations, of local banks, of the World Bank Group and others, all coming together to make this happen. The future is today, last week, History was made in my own country, in the UK. For several hours on the morning of Tuesday, May the 10th, for the first time since the era of central electricity generation began with the construction of Britain's first coal plant in 1882, no electricity was generated from coal in the UK. And this weekend, with protesters invading the largest open cast coal mine in Germany, Germany too generated all of its power from renewables. So, yes, the signs are that the future will indeed happen. But I want to tell you a story. Telling stories has a powerful history in this region, from Walcott to Kincaid to Marley to Linton Kwesi Johnson to Margaret Sir Zed Thompson, right up to Marlon James. You tell stories with great storytellers. You will have to imagine that future today to support leaders to make the decisions, different decisions that they need to make on Monday morning. So close your eyes and come with me. It's 2024. Close your eyes. It's 2024. It's the end of the decade of sustainable energy for all. The decade was ushered in just before the world agreed to the sustainable development goals and before the historic Paris Agreement. The past years have been hard. Extreme weather events have seemed to knock everyone back every time someone stepped forward. Hurricane after hurricane, storm after storm, struck with an intensity that just seemed to get angrier and angrier. But for those who had invested in terracing and resilience, like St. Lucia, they were able to keep their topsoil, they were able to get food growing again. Tourism fluctuated, people stayed away, Big cruise ships just passed on by on the horizon. Jobs were hard to come by. But tonight, in 2024, you can lean back and smile. You can nurse that drink. Lights are on in the houses across the crest of the hill. People are dancing. The mini grids are working. 
the grid-connected solar and wind is working. The floating offshore wind is working. The geothermal is working. The cables linking small islands to bigger islands exporting power are working. Heavy fuel oil has gone. Gas, there's a little bit of it, but we're not dependent upon it. And those who are leaving high school are being trained in the jobs, in maintenance and installation in a new energy economy. They're staying home. They are employed. They have income. Solar power is keeping crops well irrigated with drop per crop technology. Water is being stored effectively and efficiently, giving some respite to the harshness of the droughts that along with the storms still plague the region. Upcountry, the big solar banks and wind farms are working. They're bearing the base load. A regional utility started up four years ago with a regional agreement to share power. The agreement took years of tough negotiations, often helped by the CDB, but it happened eventually. Coupled to smart decisions around debt, it started to show a true regionally integrated way forward. It's managed by diaspora talent attracted back from New York, Toronto, and London. It is managed by a female CEO and a female COO. Now, this is a good story. This was the first time in the region that two women had taken the helm of such an important organization of economic integration. <clears throat> Renewable energy couldn't bring the fish back, couldn't bring the coral black back either, but the fish ponds on shore have kept protein in the diet. You smile, you're nursing that drink, you are forever resilient, the islands are adapting, the people are always dancing. That is the future that we must make happen, and you have to be able to trust and believe in yourselves that you can build it. The rest of the world will help, but it is only the storytellers that can tell the story that sings from your hearts. SE for All is here to empower leaders, empower you to broker the partnerships and conversations that you need to have happen, and to help you unlock the finance. So why am I optimistic? I'm optimistic because last year we got agreements that nobody thought would happen. And if you meet somebody who told you that they thought they were going to happen, please introduce them to me. And I'm optimistic because just three weeks ago, on April the 22nd, 175 countries came to New York and signed the agreement that they'd adopted in December. It wasn't just a December surprise. Now, the difficult work starts. We have to implement it. But there are stories of success everywhere, especially right here. You know, some of you in your families or you have paid more than 40 cents a kilowatt hour. But with support from international organizations, including those supported by SE for All, for example, the Clinton Climate Initiative, the Rocky Mountain Institute, Carbon War Room, there is support now to help islands plan for that future, facilitating pathways towards achieving renewable energy and energy efficiency the goals that you have set in your national energy policies, the goals that you put in your nationally determined contributions to the Paris Agreement, and the goals that you have thought about as you think about the priorities in realizing the SDGs. For example, in St. Lucia, CCI and the Rocky Mountain Institute are collaborating with the government and St. Lucia Electricity Services Limited to develop that integrated resource plan, assessing the range of generation options over a 10 plus year time frame to determine the timing, the capacity and the technology type of optimal investments. That IRP spans the investment time frame of the next 20 years and assesses techno-economic feasibility of solar, wind, geothermal, energy efficiency and storage on the island. It's only an integrated approach that will help. The objectives of this IRP are to ensure a reliable electricity supply contain costs, accelerate the trajectory towards a clean energy future. It's the first of the kind in the region. It's the first of the kind in many regions. And the way in which St. Lucia is doing this 
offers a real map for how others can too. Understanding the future energy landscape for an entire country allows for different planning decisions to be made. The results of the study are going to be available later this year, and I think that this is really quite path-breaking. Of course, the same team is also helping in the procurement of a three megawatt solar PV plant, the first utility scale renewable energy project on the island. In St. Vincent and the Grenadines, enabling a 12 megawatt geothermal project on the main island of St. Vincent is the priority. The project is the first of its kind for the island. The geothermal plant aims to provide 67% of the island's base over electricity needs. These are the things that need to be at the top of the priority list, even for stretched governments, as you think through all of that that you have to do as promised in the NDCs and in the SDGs. Aruba has made strides in offsetting fossil fuel-based generation with a 30 megawatt wind farm operating at an average annual capacity factor of 54% and plant availability of 98%. The island of 69 square miles also hosts 3.6 megawatts of solar carport at the international airport. Jamaica, about to commission a 20 megawatt solar array in Clarendon, and on top of the 62.7 megawatts of installed wind turbines in Manchester, owned by Wigton Wind Farm. And of course, the winning bidder, Eight Rivers, for a 33.1 megawatt solar facility with a PPA price of just over eight cents a kilowatt hour, with plans for 20 megawatts of PV solar to be installed to complement uh, the wind farm I've just referred to. Guadeloupe, the Bouillant geothermal plant, capacity of 15.5 megawatt. February, Antigua commissioned three megawatts of solar near VC Bird International Airport. Barbados's experimentation with solar water heating going all the way back to 1974. Over, it's allowed people to install solar takes to sell the power back to the grid at 1.6 times the usual charge. You know all of this, but do you tell yourself these stories? When you start to add it all up, this is a different story of the Caribbean than many people here and this is an important story because this is the story that investors need to understand together with all of the other stories that they hear from the region and about the region. Nevis, St. Lucia and Dominica all have sought to develop geothermal energy projects, another source of renewable, abundant renewable energy with huge potential in the Caribbean. Imagine a story where you're energy exporters as a region, not inconceivable with the geothermal resources that you have and with the advances in technology and an integrated regional approach. I know that the CDB is taking these projects, some of these projects to its board. I know yesterday you approved a geothermal project. Working out how to buy down the risk of the upfront costs of something that is going to be abundant, cheap and affordable in the future seems to me an extremely wise leadership role for the CDB. So what needs to happen now? Well, you have all of these stories, but they need to become an integrated regional approach to an energy future that meets everybody's needs. It requires the right kinds of institutions, transparent, well-managed, well-governed institutions. Without them, it will slow things down. If capital costs are too high, it will slow things down. If the policy signals set by every nation in the region are incoherent, it will slow things down. By incoherent, I mean not having your prices right, not putting your subsidies where you really need them, and not setting the right incentives for long-term investments in clean power. There is tremendous responsibility on the shoulders of government leaders to ensure that the public policy in place creates a level playing field for new technologies and business models that can and will serve the people of these islands and region well. This means not just the basic enabling environment that will attract investors, but the specific management and governance of utilities and other entities in the energy system. While many believe that, that, they, will benef while many believe that they benefit today from the energy systems, those systems are struggling to be reliable, affordable and sustainable. Many more people will benefit from brave decisions taken early by islands and others in this region, and the examples that I've already outlined show that that is possible. 
Of course, all of this happens in a complex web of macroeconomic dynamics in the region, of creditworthiness and indebtedness. The vulnerability the region already faces due to climate change and the costs and debts incurred because of it cannot now be the source of further penalization of the countries in this region. This requires that the region, working with its regional institutions, preeminent among them the CDB, and with the international community, need to ensure that the risks of economies that are vulnerable to extreme weather events and other climate impacts not be an additional burden in terms of access to and the price of capital. You will need a strong, coherent regional voice to other international organizations in order to make sure that this doesn't happen. We are happy to help. Vulnerability should be counted as a factor in access to concessional funds of support for clean and affordable energy, among other things. Parties will have to come together to agree how borrowing can occur to spur the investment in the infrastructure this region needs, but there's much that the region can do on its own. Regional agreements and approaches will have to take place alongside the innovation we already see. I'm here to tell you that I believe that there is a, a, a real alignment and perhaps a realignment of investor interest and public funds because of the plunging price of clean technology and because of the understanding of the sensitivities of risk to holding too much carbon in one's portfolio as a long-term investor. Because the direction of travel is clear, the point on the horizon that we all agree to is clear, holding carbon into the long run, in the long run is increasingly being seen as a risky proposition. I believe that Haiti is a special case given the particular needs that it has in access. And this is going to require extraordinary coming together of parties, international development banks, local actors, led by the people of Haiti, led by the voice of those who are energy poor in order to find the solutions that are really needed. We cannot allow, as I said, with the management of CDB this morning, for the perfect to drive out the good. So how can the Caribbean Development Bank help? Like others in the multilateral development finance community, the CDB has an essential role to play. Its priorities are oriented to the priorities of its members, expressed through the Sustainable Development Goals and the strategies that have been put in place. The region cannot wait for others to lead the way. It has to lead its own way and that includes the CDB. Pooling capital, working in close partnership with other colleague institutions, the Inter-American Development Bank and the World Bank Group, obviously is important. Having them take your lead closer to your clients as you are is important. The priority should be on the large projects for multilateral development banks, the large financing that's needed to put in place the infrastructure, the management, and the rules and regulations that will allow a centralized and decentralized energy system to operate in this region. Together with CARICOM, the regional bodies must focus on underpinning the regional pieces of the puzzle and convening others from bilaterals to philanthropy to impact investors and all kinds of private investors into the pieces of the puzzle which are a priority nationally and locally. What does a plan to have clean, affordable access to energy by all by the mid-2020s look like? What policies do members need to have in place to in crowd in that investment? How much institutional reform is needed? These are all questions the CDB should ask of itself and of its members. If it should not lead, then it should commission. It can speak truth to its members. Where will we find the management capacity in small countries to manage an integrated energy system. This is something that is bedeviled and frankly escapes the ability of large developed countries with huge energy management infrastructures. The CDB could help attract that capacity. Go find it. We almost need an energy core for the size of the challenge that we face. Maybe even house it. Can that capacity better be attracted at the regional level than nation by nation? Does climate change spur integration with an urgency that has eluded the region up till now? As a region, can the Caribbean find solutions that it cannot as nations alone? Exporters of geothermal, regional networks, diversified economies based on affordable, abundant, clean power, 
offshoring all kinds of services to those bigger economies nearby. These are all pieces of visions that are already in place in leaders in this region. Can it be knitted together into an exciting f f uh, whole for the future? I believe perhaps so. Remember that in Paris, it was the High Ambition Coalition, led by many of your diplomats, together with diplomats from other small island developing nations, backed by your political leaders, that provided the impetus for the boldest parts of the agreement. The United States, Brazil, the European Union, India, and China were frankly bounced into the High Ambition Coalition. You have spoken truth to power in the context of climate change in Paris. Now you need to speak it here in terms of what you need, when you need it, and where you need it. You set a bold goal in the INDCs that you submitted to Paris. 100% renewables was included in almost every submission of a small island developing state. To make that happen will require all of us, all of you. It will require all of the development banks. It will require a really synthetic understanding of the risk of not acting today and of postponing that to tomorrow. But helping leaders with the Monday morning problem, what do I do first, in what order do I do things, which piece of the puzzle can I first take uh, as mine is an important part of the CDB's role. And please don't forget that while we focus on renewable energy, it must be because we are putting energy efficiency first. If we can reduce the amount of energy we have to generate, then why not do it? And setting clear performance standards across every aspect of the economy and being very clear to investors, from tourism to manufacturing to uh, transport, that these are the standards that must be met is an essential, relatively easy, low-cost way of meeting your sustainable energy for all goals. Before I conclude, I want to say one thing about diversity. Actually, I want to say one thing about women. I said diversity just to relax the guys in the room. It's actually about both. Women bear the burden of a lack of sustainable energy for all. It's an unspoken burden. It's running around trying to work out how you're going to cook the food if the lights go out and if the gas goes off or if the power is just not there. It's the worrying about whether the kids are going to get the homework done because it's dark when, when the sun sets. It's worrying about everything else that needs to get done. It's the woman who's the small business owner who simply can't sell patties on the side of the road because she couldn't cook them because there wasn't any power. The numbers are quite significant. When we talk about the 1.1 billion people who don't have access to energy, and you put a face on those 1.1 billion people, then the stories of women and the stories of the children that they protect and that they raise becomes very powerful. And if you think you can grow a sustainable economy in this region without using the brains, brawn, and resilience of the women in the population of this region, then I, I don't quite see the same thing that you do. And so there is a real urgency to making sure that we have sustainable energy because it will free up 50% of the resources that you have in this region to play a role in that dynamic economic growth that you talk about and that you want here at the CDB. At the same time, the energy sector is the least diverse sector of all sectors of the economy. 6% of the boardrooms of energy companies have women sitting in seats. 6%. Now, I'm not here to say that there should be a lot more women on boards, but I am here to tell you that the evidence that diverse teams manage risk better and that diverse teams make better long-term risk-based decisions and that diverse teams achieve greater financial returns for their firms, that's rock-solid evidence from every region of the world. And so if you're building an energy company, if you're building an energy utility, if you're building any entity in the energy space going forward, and not concerned about the diversity in the boardroom and the management, you're missing a play. 
you are risking leaving money on the table and you're risking not being able to manage the transition as smoothly as you probably need to. So I'm here with a message that this transition cannot leave anybody behind and so we must worry about those women who are not well served because they will take care of the rest of us. But we also have to manage the transition and we need diversity in the management of that transition if we are to survive it well. So, I want to end by saying that the United Nations, the Secretary General and I have absolute faith in the ability of the Caribbean leadership to tackle the risks and seize the opportunities to meet the challenge that climate change brings to the achievement of the sustained economic growth of the sustainable development we all agreed to as an international community last year here in the Caribbean. Sustainable Energy for All is ready to partner with Caribbean governments, the civil society and business in the region and with the Caribbean Development Bank in order to support you to make that vision come true. In 2024, the end of the decade, we should have closed the energy access gap. We should be well on the way to achieving the penetration rates of renewables in the energy mix. We should have put energy efficiency first. The Responsibility Act for this and current generations is with us. It is your children that will ask you where you were and what you were doing when you knew and you understood the stakes. And let's not forget the wise words that Derek Walcott taught us. The future happens. Together we can move further and faster towards that future. It is a better future. It is a safer future. It is a more prosperous future. It is a just future. Not for some, but for all. Thank you. Ms. Kite, would you remain, please? Wonderful, thank you. And now we have an opportunity to have a conversation about what we just heard. We have ushers with mics across the room. I invite you for the next 10 minutes or so to share thoughts and ask questions. The floor is now open. Yes, please stand. Identify yourself. Thank you, Tucson Boys CDB. Uh, I'd like to thank you for that message. Who knew I'd come to hear about sustainable energy and get a lesson as well in diversity? I felt uh, that when you lifted your eyes off the paper and you spoke from your heart about diversity in, in the context of energy, that you were really, it, it, it sort of, it was a new message. And I'd like to tell you a brief story. <laughs> Uh, my father left my mother to raise seven children on her own. So that woman you were talking about, I felt it personally. And my question is, how can we make the story of the need for sustainable energy and diversity as well as understandable to the generation that is coming up, as simple as possible, and put it within their reach, and by us I mean CDB as well, what would you advise as some of the lessons that you've learned to be able to make that as understandable and simplified as possible? Thank you, Dr. Boyce. Uh, hi. Oops, well, that's loud. I feel, I, <clears throat> I feel I should sing. No, um, uh, that would be very bad for everybody. Um, look, I think you're answering your own question. Um, because you know, everybody, we all have, we all have a story. And, we, you know, if you don't have to scratch very hard. We all have an energy story. And I think that CDB has remarkable stories. I mean, you know, I, I just gave you sort of like eight examples of what's already happening in the region. And yet, you know, when you, when you talk outside of the region about the region is, you know, buffeted by climate change, less than optimum economic management and leadership of certain institutions and governments. I mean, you know, there's, a, there's an image 
and um, I think that there, there are investors, domestic and international, who are extremely interested in being storytellers in this new story of clean energy and want to be in at the ground level and, and want to be making smart investments because it's, I mean, it's, the direction of travel is clear, so being in early makes a lot of sense. And there are increasingly investors who understand the particular dynamics of clean energy versus the dynamics of the fossil fuel industry that we've been invested in for the last 150 years. And so the more that you can tell stories and the more that you can, I mean, it's not only telling stories so that the political leaders today realize how much is already happening in their own region and that they could do something different on Monday morning than what they were planning to do, or that they could take a little bit more political risk than they think they can afford to take, or that the people are actually with them um, to take that decision to, you know, you know, take the bet on geothermal, even though perhaps it's going to cost more in the short run, but it will be less expensive in the long run, or to manage the land acquisition for that wind farm in that place, because over time everybody will come to accept it. So telling stories is important for the political leaders here, but it's really important for the region, because there is opportunity here um, that perhaps you know not everybody sees. And at the same time, um, there is a real need for the region to speak with one voice in order to attack the problems in the macroeconomic space and the fiscal space, which will really hold the region back. So there has to be, I mean, it's impossible for the international community to make all of these agreements and not resolve some of the issues of macroeconomic and fiscal policy that the region is, um, that it faces. And I'm not, you know, I'm not here to pick winners or losers or point fingers at anybody, but that has to be resolved. I mean, the UN has to resolve the status of, uh, of the developing, least developed countries in the region vis-a-vis -vis vulnerability. This has been a debate that's been kicking around the UN for 10, 15 years. I mean, we have to resolve it now because we agreed last year we're not going to leave anybody behind. So there's, a new, there's an opportunity for urgency but I think telling stories is important because otherwise people don't connect the dots. You connect the dots. Thank you. Do we have any other question? Okay, thank you. Please stand and identify yourself. Okay. Good evening. I'm Peter Thorne from the Caribbean Broadcasting Corporation. I want to know what would fuel your optimism that Caribbean people would get, or the Caribbean governments, uh, on behalf of our, the people of the region, would be able to go towards a clean, efficient energy economy or economies by 2024 at the end of the decade. Because when you look at the region, you would have seen that about in 2009, you had oil prices hovering about 110 US dollars a barrel. Those prices dipped recently to under 40 US dollars a barrel. And we, the people of the region, are yet to see any of those prices in terms of decrease passed on to us. We are still in the highest 25 um, prices um, in our countries in terms of the, the, the price of oil um, in the world. So I want to know, um, given the history of the region, you have, um, I don't have to look at the Federation, I don't have to look at the CCJ just in 2004, and even those that have the headquarters for it are yet to sign on in 2016. Are we dreaming? Um, we, 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 all the studies have said that we can really um, capitalize on or transform Caribbean economies into clean energy efficient systems until at least by 2029. What concrete evidence can you put on the table, uh, given the lack of political will in the Caribbean, that this transformation can come about? So a really good question. So um, a couple of years ago, the orthodoxy was that um, if oil prices fell, all investment in renewables would drop off. Uh, the exact opposite has happened. 
So oil prices tumbled, have stayed low. Lots of people arguing about where they're going to go next, but not right back up anytime soon. Increased investment in renewables. And this year, it's expected that the investment in renewables in developing countries will, will exceed investment in renewables in developed countries. Next point. How many people in this room thought that in 2016 they'd be able to see eight cents a kilowatt hour renewable energy in Jamaica? Huh? I bet you, right? Not many. There is something profoundly important happening in technology. And the challenge the world over, not just in the Caribbean, is to get policy and finance to catch up with what's happening in technology. There was a renewable project bid out last week in Dubai, Dubai, you know, close to the home of oil, for 2.99 cents a kilowatt hour. You can do wind in Texas for four, you can do wind and solar in Chile for six, you can do, uh, you can do solar in Morocco for eight, and I think you can do solar in South Africa for, for five. Um, even without the decrepit subsidy regimes that still exist in many of these markets, it's competitive, and it's competitive now, and companies know how to build it. The technology risk has come all the way down. This is the future. And so, you know, I'm, I'm not from the region. Um, I have a global mandate, but I'm here to tell you that with policy and finance aligned behind what is now technologically possible, and with new generations of investors and new investors interested, you know, the banks might not be intermediating renewables the way that everybody thought they would. You know, the world of project finance died and didn't come back quite the way everybody thought it would. Um, if you talk to renewables operators, they're getting the financing from very different places. It's a whole new world out there. Put your policy in regime in place that supports a long-term view a bipartisan view that clean energy is the future for your island nation, for your nation in the Caribbean, and work with clarity about what financing you want, the technology's there. And I think, as I said from some of the examples that I went through, the rewards are already there for those that are making a bet in that direction. So I don't know how you throw off your past. Uh, believe you me. <laughs> In the UK, we have a long past, so we have a lot that we have to throw off. But um, I, I do think, and I don't believe that this is Pollyanna, I don't believe it's naive, because it's already happening. Uh, but I think there are proven resources in this region, and they are to be exploited. And they are to be exploited by visionary leadership, public and private. It's already, part of it's already in place in the region. And I think that it could be maximized by greater integration. Integration is a decision that has to be made amongst Caribbean nations. But you can imagine now, with these proven resources and with the technology at the place where it is, that perhaps there's even something to be greater, uh, more greatly maximized by discussions around uh, energy, uh, regional energy markets and regional energy cooperation and regional energy projects. Excellent. Thank you very much. Once again, Rachel Kites.